Welcome to the Live Well and Stay Healthy Wellness Webinar Series brought to you by the Family and Community Health Sciences Department of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. My name is Rachel Tanzi and I am with FCHS here in Monmouth County and I will serve as your host today. I'm very excited to be hosting this presentation of Eat This, Not That, a certainly a topic we can all benefit from. Visit our website for nutrition and wellness related resources and follow us on social media. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Christine Zellers. Christine Zellers is a family and community health sciences county educator in Cape May County, where she educates the community on wellness, nutrition, and fitness. She has extensive experience collaborating with partners to create health, food, healthy food environments in the areas of policy systems and environmental change. In addition to community health policies, Chris works to educate residents on topics to improve their overall health and prevent chronic disease with a holistic approach to a well-lived quality lifestyle that includes physical activity, a nutrient-dense diet, and quality sleep. Today, she will help us get a better understanding on some food marketing and have a discussion on healthy, delicious options available. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to you, Chris. Thanks, Rachel, I appreciate it. Hi, everyone, it's so nice to be with you today. Um, I appreciate you, your gracious hospitality and hosting me. And like Rachel said, I'm going to be, uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, Eat This, Not That. Um, I do have a survey here, um, and if you would be so kind, you can open your phone up and um, open it to your um, photo, your camera, and if you hold it up to the screen there and scan it in, it'll take you to a survey, and any feedback that you can give me about today's presentation would be much appreciated. I'll put this up again at the end, but I just wanted you to be able to open your, computer, your uh, phones if uh, you wanted to do that um, beforehand so you have it ready when we're done the presentation. And I also am offering a chance to win a prize for people that complete the survey that leave their email behind on there. All right, so today's objection, um, today's presentation has three objection objectives. And um, first we're gonna talk about um, the differences between accurate food advertising um, that provides a you know, healthy option versus buzzwords. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about foods that people often substitute as healthy options. Um, so again, like what the messaging is there and how we're interpreting it, maybe, maybe it is what we think, maybe it's not. And then I'm gonna finally give you some substitutes for high fat, high sugar foods with flavorful choices so that if you want to make those options and decisions for yourself, you're able to do so hopefully um, as an educated consumer. Um, so food advertising and buzzwords, um, during, you know, there's been a really big growth of health and wellness um, products on the market in the industry. And those, that large number of health and wellness um, products coming out, coupled with our desire, you know, for the next healthy quick fix option, sometimes allows us to fall um, victim to those advertising and buzz, buzzwords that are out there. And they make us think that we're eating maybe a little bit more healthy than what we are um, in reality. And, you know, we, we might fall prey to those sweet sounding ideas, you know, um, but the bottom line, if it's too good, if it sounds like it's too good to be true, it might be too good to be true. So just to, you know, I'm going to go over some things to give you a, a good idea about you know, ways to be healthier and, and check out those buzzwords and have some idea where they came from. So there's a lot of buzzwords out here. This is just a few. This is just to name a few. But there's a lot of buzzwords out there that pertain to products that we consume or eat. And things like organic or, or natural, functional foods, GMO, um, you know, they're all out there. You'll see them on little labels and things like that. And sometimes, you know, the advertisers or the product will even advertise them on you know, TV or media or something like that for us. So um, it's really important for us to know what we're eating and to know what the label on the food means and understand that. Um, some of these labels indicate how items are grown or raised, while others indicate what the food is or what the container is even made of. Sometimes they go as far as to tell us what the container is made of so we can be an aware consumer that way. Um, everyone you know, everybody's going to have a different level of importance on what they think is important. Like I might think it's really important, you know, for it to be local while somebody else might feel that way about organic, but everybody has a different need. Um, so I'll go through some of them and, and talk a little bit about some of these buzzwords in a little bit greater detail. Um, and, 
you know, give you some ideas how if you want to figure out what these buzzwords mean or these labels mean, you could find out for yourself and um, actually, you know, look at the information. I wanted to give you a little bit of a brief, maybe not so brief history of the of labeling um, and specifically the nutrition facts label. Um, it's good. I'm hoping that doing this will give us a perspective on the progression of the nutrition facts label. And what's really important to remember here is that nutrition is really an ever-changing science. Um, and so is the progression of the, the food label. So I think that hearing how things changed, it kind of reflects the way, you know, our food needs change, our supply changes, and what we as um, consumers are able to know is good for us um, and what so science is able to tell us is good for us as things change and develop. And a lot of the, the reason that it's ever-changing and ever-changing science when I say that is because our food supply does change and, and the way things are produced changes. So that's why um, it's constantly moving on us. Um, the changes of society and public's nutrition needs is really the basis for any updates that are made or changes that are reflected um, you know, on the label. And they're a reflection of the chronic disease prevention needs and food preparation needs of um, the dietary recommendations that we have. In the years between 1941 and 1966, there really wasn't any type of nutrition label, except for those that um, were ne needed to be special dietary labels, such as particular, particular dietary needs um, such as physical or pathological or other conditions. So they would, they, um, they would label them as such if there were those needs between 1941 and 1966. Then in the mid to late 1960s, packaged foods in the U.S. became much more relevant because there was a change in the workforce. So during World War II, many more women entered the workforce, and that kind of brought about the need for food to be able to be prepared quickly and conveniently. And so that made it, you know, that increase in popularity for the quick meal um, in the 1960s made packaged field, uh, packaged food, you know, kind of have a need um, to know what was in it. So it made it more evident than, than in years past that we needed to have some type of information about what was in there. In the late 1960s also, um, more packaged goods became available because of this need. And so we were eating a lot more packaged goods than we had been previously. In 1969, uh, the White House Food Conference on, nutrition, nutri on Food, Nutrition, and Health made a recommendation that the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, um, come up with a system to identify the nutritional quality of foods, whereby instituting the food markers um, are, you know, provide truthful information to consumers about the content of their products. So they were saying, okay, you can say stuff about this product, but you have to make it truthful. And they wanted the FDA to monitor this. Then in 1972, the FDA created a format and started to implement regulations on nutrition labels that included voluntary labeling unless the product made specific claims about its nutrition. And then in 1973, labels were created that contained calories, grams of protein, carbohydrates, fats, and the U.S. recommended daily allowances of proteins and various vitamins such as A, C, and riboflavin, uh, niacin, calcium, and iron. The FDA allowed discretionary reporting of other elements such as salt or sodium, saturated fat, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So they didn't have to report those like today we do, but they were starting to say you can do that if you so desire as a, as a product manufacturer. Then not a lot of stuff really changed until the late 1970s when it was suggested the nutrition labels be mandated and changes be made to improve the labeling. Um, so, you know, they started to make these changes and things came around, um, making it more evident that we needed to do some things to really fix stuff up. Um, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the 1990s, the Nutrition uh, Labeling and Education Act, or L NLEA, was instituted, and it was the most legislation that had been put forth in 50 years on nutrition labeling. And it gave the FDA the oversight and enforcement of nutrition labels and required it um, based, it'd be based on healthy diet components so that it was widely understood by American consumers and was uniform across the board. And in doing so, you know, they kind of came up with something that we were all supposed to understand. And the final regulations published in January of 1993 mandated nutrition labeling in the form of a nutrition facts panel on packaged food, which is our nutrition facts label that we see. And then not a lot changed again, kind of came to that stagnant point. Not a lot was going on. 
And then, you know, as you'll notice, there is updates made to the uh, nutrition facts label. As you look at it, you may have noticed in the last few years, there's added sugars on there. So they kind of, they make those recommendations and make those updates based on what we need as consumers. If they see that we're not getting enough fiber, they might, you know, they'll add that information on there. So we know how to get more of what we need for our bodies to be the best health we can be. So in addition to nutrition facts labels, there's other labels um, on products. And we're going to talk a little bit about them too as we move forward. But I just wanted to give you a background that, you know, about the regulations and how they were implemented and how they came to be. Also wanted to tell you that the FDA is a governing agency on many claims that appear on food labels. So I wanted to explain how the FDA regulates its food standards. The FDA continues to modernize food standards to maintain the basic nature and essential characteristics of products while allowing industry flexibility for innovation to produce more healthful foods and meeting consumer expectations. The FDA believes it's important to take a fresh look at existing standards of identity in light of marketing and consumer trends and the latest nutritional sciences. So they are monitoring it, but they are allowing for products to be developed and you know, to attract our attention. So let's talk about examples of food riddles on these labels and what exactly do they all mean? Um, working through this maze of food labels and markers, it's really, I know, it's not easy. I even, um, I look a lot of times at things and I'm like, wait, what does this mean? Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll look into it a little bit further, but it is confusing. And it's, it's something that, you know, takes a little bit of time. I have a friend who constantly comes by my house and my husband will come up from getting the mail and there'll be like a yogurt container in his hand. And I'll know that my friend has been there and she wants me to read, translate the label for her because she's not getting what it's saying. So I understand it is difficult and sometimes it takes a little bit um, to figure it out. But I just wanted to take some time to kind of review what these labels mean and what the markers on them are. Um, that are, you know, Some are required to support health claims like the nutrition facts label, but some of them aren't really regulated or governed um, the way you might think. So I'm going to provide with you some examples of these buzzwords and how you can understand them on the packages um, so that you can be a, an informed consumer. I divided them into three areas because there's so many of them and it's a little bit overwhelming. I divided them into three sections. So grown food systems is the first section, the grown food or like how they're labeling it by how they grow it or what the food system is. The second um, area is a health area, like they're saying it's something that provides health for us or a food claim. And then finally, I broke it down to the last section, which is food preparation and the contents. So let's take a little deeper dive on that and start out with what, you know, the grown, the grown out aspect of it. So how the product is grown. And in the area of food systems or how it's grown, it means that the product claim is related somehow in that way to how it's grown. Organic. I'm sure everybody's heard the term. It's a it's a big buzzword. It's, it was very popular um, and still is for a while. But I want you. I don't know, Rachel. I guess I can see the chat. I can. I was wondering if you could put into the chat what you think organic means. Um, just a word or two. Like, what do you think? What do you think when you're buying organic, or what do you think it means to buy organic? What that organic product is. And we'll take a look at that. Do you want me to read them to you? I'll go look at it. It's fine. I can okay. I can check on which. Thanks. All right. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we talk about it, how the food is processed or cared for, you, you might be paying more for it. And that's why I really, you know, I thought it'd be a good idea to go through this. And a few years ago, I used to go to a class regularly and teach. And when I taught the, at this class regularly, these folks were food preparers. Um, you know, they were they were servers and food preparers, and they get special requests. Oh, sorry they would get special requests and they wouldn't know what they meant. So they would ask me a lot of times, well, what does GMO mean? Or, or what does this mean? So I know that it's, a, it's a, a subject area that people don't always quite understand. So somebody says more expensive, uh, no chemical fertilizers, uh, no, no, not GMO, no pesticides used, without pesticides, these days nothing, okay? Grown without pesticides or herbicides, no chemicals. Um, okay, great. Good answers. All right, so let's let's dive in a little bit more uh, to organic, and look at you know now we looked at your answers. Organic does not mean without use of pesticides, which is a very that's a very common common misunderstanding about organic food. The legal definition of pesticide is any substance that kills a pest. 
Organic farmers may use pesticides. However, to be certified organic, they need to be free of sewage, sludge, radiation, genetically modified substances. I saw somebody have that on there and synthetic fertilizers. Organic farmers are required to be certified and they do go through rigorous protocols to become um, deemed certified organic by the USDA in their growing processes and handling processes. But it does not mean without pesticides. Further, if you see, you might see on the label that it says certified exempt organic. And that simply means that it's a smaller farm and it's saying that the organic, um, they are organic, but they are exempt on being certified organic because they're a smaller farm. So they could actually be organic, but they're just a smaller farm. The health benefits of organic foods are over non-organic foods um, varies in research studies, but organic fruits and vegetables will have less pes pesticide residue according to the University of Connecticut Cooperative Extension. Food um, systems indicators or where the food comes from or where it is grown are also markers some consumers use to determine whether or not something is sustainable, fresh, or environment, environmentally correct food. So for, for example, people, you'll sometimes hear people in addition to like organic, which we heard the definition of that. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, it, I, I buy local. So same thing, there's a, there's a big assumption about what locally grown farm is. But local is defined as not close by as one might think. You, you might think, that, okay, let me see. I live here in Cape May County, so I'm going to say that local is a farmer that grew it here in Cape May County. But that's not necessarily the, the, um, the thing that defines it because there's no set length of travel for a food to be deemed local. So the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, defines local by saying there is no predetermined distance to define what consumers consider local, but a set number of miles from a center point or state location boundary is often used. So that might be, it's going to be different in every circumstance. It can be different in every circumstance. So if you really want to know how local your, your food is, then you need to read the label. So on the front, for instance, um, yesterday we were eating blueberries, 4th of July, and we looked to see we're down here in Southern New Jersey. And we know that Hamilton obviously is our big produce uh, uh, producer of blueberries here in New Jersey. So um, somebody made the comment, oh, well, you know, New Jersey has such great blueberries and here in Hamilton, we're so lucky. And I said, oh, are those from Hamilton? because I had bought them at the grocery store. And yes, indeed, they were from Hamilton. So obviously they were local because they were close by, but there's no predetermined. So if you look at that front packaging label where it has the blueberries and maybe the farm name, it will tell you, you know, that they were grown in Hamilton or they were grown, you know, somewhere out of the country or something like that. So that'll give you an indicator if you're not sure. Uh, and it'll tell you just how, you know, local it might be. Um, but there, there's not necessarily a indicator on there that except for that USDA definition that it, it could vary. Um, we do, fortunately, in New Jersey have the Jersey Fresh label. That um, can, that is a that is required some you know more rigorous. They have to be showing they can't they can't have something out of the farm stand that says it's Jersey fresh if it's not from New Jersey. Um, so they have standards with that. So if, you know with being here in New Jersey, we can use that Jersey fresh label for you know something that does have more of an indicator of local roots. Uh, the next one on the list is pasture raised, um, and there's another example of how something is grown or in this case raised. And according to North Carolina State University Extension, the pasture raised uh, pasture raised claim only indicated how the animal was raised, not how it was fed. So that's important to know if you're if you're thinking you're buying pasture raised and that's qualifying how it was fed. It is not. The designation may imply that the animal grew up in free roaming environment, but it only signals that's the way it was raised, not how it was fed. And I mention this because sometimes people really think that the pasture raised means that it's grass fed, but it doesn't. And we're going to touch on grass fed in a minute. And there is no third party certification for fat pasture fed um, food. So there's nobody saying, yes, this is definitely pasture fed, pasture raised, pasture fed. Um, it, it's more, um, you know, it's, it's just out there. They can put it on the label. Um, the USDA does certify organic, for instance, um, but there's no, you know, legal regulations on pasture raised claims as there is with the USDA. Grass fed, again, um, from North Carolina State University Extension, um, 
these claims mean that the animal had access to pasture their entire life and they were not, not fed grains. You may also see a label that says an animal has been grass fed at some point, which should also contain a percentage of grain to grass fed somewhere in the label. So if it's not just if it's not just grass, if they are getting some grain in there, then it's gonna give you that percentage. And again, this labeling is not verified by a third party and no one um, you know, is coming out to inspect or certify the grass fed claim. So the difference is that the grain fed animals tend to have um, a white, more white marbly. So if you're talking like red meat, the, grass, uh, the grain fed animals will have more of that marbly um, white type texture to the, to the meat. And then um, if it's green, or I'm sorry, if it's um, grass fed, it's gonna have more of a yellow fat content to the meat. There is a taste difference and often a cost difference with that too, because the grass fed, fed animal has to be on the farm longer to get big enough to move to market. So that costs the farmer a little bit more, which on the production end, and that gets passed along to us as consumers. Also grass fed tends to be lower in calories because of that, remember I talked about the marbleization and the fat, it has lower amounts of fat. So it tends to have less fat. So again, these are all choices that you can make. It's gonna you know, depend one way or the other to you, but in the long run, um, you know, it's just good information to have because sometimes, they'll, as you'll see in a minute, they'll put claims on things that, you know, wouldn't, it doesn't matter that they have the claim on there, but they put it on there. So you think you might be getting something you're not. Uh, cage-free is the next one up and claim, and these cage-free claims do not mean that the poultry is roaming free on the farm, loving life, according to University of Kentucky um, Extension. Rather, it means not being kept in a cage, but they're also not outside. So they're not running around in the sunshine like you might think. Um, usually the chickens are still in a controlled environment to prevent animals from getting to them and to control the light and temperature for better production of these um, animals. The poultry has limited access to food and fresh water and may be very small and crowded. Um, so many cage-free claims aren't certified either. So that's all, I, I found that one interesting um, with the cage-free information. Free range, um, I put this one in here to the discussion because I saw something that was really interesting when I was doing my research from University of Connecticut. Free range does not indicate that the animal went outside in its life time, only that there were doors to the outside. So yeah, the term does not specifically imply outdoor conditions, but pastures are permitted to be fenced and covered in netting. So, you know, it again, implies something a little different than what I thought it implied, but yeah, um, so you know that one. And then also GMOs, I saw somebody had put that in um, about the, um, the organic information, they included that. So GMO, if you're not aware, since stands for genetically modified organism. And GMO means the food has genes changed using genetic engineering rather than traditional crossbreeding. So most scientists agree that genetically modified foods are as safe for consumers as non-GMO foods. Um, and when it comes to the, GM, the genetically modification or bioengineering, there are two types of labels that you might see for foods manufactured. And there are, um, there's the food manufacturer and the third party created the non-GMO. I'm gonna show you one of them in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ingredients labeled non-GMO cannot use genetic modification. However, only a few products such as corn and soybeans even have a genetically modified version. So no government agency such as the FDA or the USDA certifies the non-GMO label. Um, but again, you know, I noticed I'm gonna show you a label from my pineapples in a minute. And here I'm letting you know that pineapples are not genetically modified, but they're on the label as such. So again, interesting little way to get my attention. And if I'm interested in, you know, eating that way, I say, oh, I'll buy this product. It's non-GMO, but usually they tend to be non-GMO anyway. Bioengineer is a new label that became mandatory on January 1 of 2022. And the USDA Agriculture Marketing Service is administering this label. Labels must appear on all food products that are genetically modified. However, genetic differences are undetectable in highly refined products like corn syrup or soybean, and they will not need to be labeled. Um, additionally, products made from animals who receive bioengineer feed will not be labeled. While the USDA has created a bioengineered label for manufacturers to use, they may also, they may not put that label on there. They might put a QR code on there or electronic disclosure or provide a number for a text message 
or simply use the phrase bioengineered food or contains bioengineered food ingredients. So you can um, start seeing those, but again, oops, you might end up seeing, um, you know, something that you, what is this bioengineer? You might see that QR code. So they're all there. Um, okay, sorry. Okay. So moving on to the second area was like the health. I said, we're going to talk about what does it mean with health and, and, you know, um, how it makes us healthier, those type of claims. And this list that is shown here refers to how the product might impact our health. Um, some of these buzzwords are, are you know, um, catch on and they become a way of eating um, because people think that they're eating better and everybody wants that, you know, way to eat better. But they don't always have a definition that's specific, as you'll see, in relation to health or what you might be thinking. Um, but you have to kind of be an informed consumer and decide if it's something that you're willing to pay more money for, if that's the case, or, you know, you want to do some research and find out just how um, good for you it is. Um, so let's start with probiotics. Probiotics are living bacteria that can be found in dairy products. Um, things like, think like Greek yogurt, for instance, um, that is a probiotic and it introduces new bacteria in the colon. And this is needed to keep everything functioning properly. So you'll hear talk about probiotics and the benefits of them. And that's what it's doing essentially is making that new bacteria in your body. And then probiotic foods include not only, um, you know, uh, Greek yogurt, but things like miso soup, brine uh, cured olives, raw cheese and sauerkraut. However, some foods or supplements advertise that they contain probiotics as a mean of promoting health benefits. And, you know, the FDA has not approved any specific health claims for probiotics because the research varies from strain to strain and within each condition. So this means that the evidence is not cohesive enough to um, claim that it's you know, certified by the FDA for health. So that's why the FDA is not doing it, you know, certifying them yet. If you want to try to get probiotics, which, you know, are a good thing to have, so, you, you know, if you're showing the, if you're showing results from them and you feel like it's a good thing for you, try eating foods like um, the ones I mentioned above. And then also if you're vegan or vegetarian, you might want to eat the sauerkraut or kombucha to meet, maintain your diet and get those probiotics if you're looking to do that. But, you know, those claims on the, on the supplements, you know, aren't really certified yet because there's still, the research is still out on them. Prebiotics um, are specialized fiber that come from plants and help to nourish the good bacteria we already have in our colon. So essentially, prebiotics are fertilizing the probiotics to make them grow. And fibrous foods are prebiotics like onions and leeks, bananas, flax seed, yams, and asparagus. And as Americans, we really miss the mark on eating enough fibrous food and we don't get enough fiber in our diet. So good bacteria you know, we need that to make sure that we get everything flowing the way it would, should. And you can get those prebiotics naturally with these fibrous foods. Um, eat more fruits and veggies to get them. And in the case of both pre and prebiotics and probiotics, eating whole foods like dairy products and those vegetables are really ways to help improve your gut health and keep yourself, on, you know, moving along the way you want to. Functional foods is the next one listed on here. And a functional food is one that has a potential benefit of health when consumed as part of a varied diet. So varied diet means we're eating a bunch of different fruits and vegetables, not just the same ones. Um, and we you know, have a variety in our diet. According to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, functional foods include whole, include whole foods as well as those that are fortified, enriched, or enhanced. All foods on some level are considered functional foods. And there, there are substances and other well-known nutrients in some foods that may provide health benefits. Foods with these potential health benefits are known as functional foods. It is, not, it is important to note that there is no legal or universally accepted definition in the United States for functional foods, meaning that it is not regulated by any governmental agency, such as the uh, Food and Drug Administration. So we can say something's a functional food. It can still mean it's functional, but it's not being certified anywhere. And then we go on to superfood. So again, superfood has no scientific basis and no certification or regulations. And if you hear um, a food, you know, sometimes salmon is referred to as a superfood or blueberries. Um, and that's likely because they have a really good nutritional value. And that, that's true, they do. But it also, you know, the first superfood was, the word superfood was introduced during World War I 
when a company was manufacturing bananas as a superfood, which not, you know, bananas are good, right? It's not to say that they're not a good superfood, but there was really no claim to them. And that, that still holds true today. Um, you know, you can say that there's superfood, but um, it does, you have to look at the true nutritional value to make sure it's truly a nutritional um, option for you or a superfood. Um, so it's just like calling me super mom, um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm a super mom, maybe I'm not, but there's no certification to whether or not that's true. So um, superfood, be on the lookout, make sure it's really nutritious and not something that's just labeled that way. All right, and then the way food is prepared um, is the last section here. Um, and my favorite one of all time is all natural. <laughs> and I had a doctor one time say something to me um, and it really resonated with me. I said something was all natural and she said, well, yep, so is poison ivy. Poison ivy is all natural, but we're not going to eat it. So I think of that when I'm looking at all natural products, <laughs> because, um, you know, knowing how natural something is, is it's important, um, but, you know, it might not always be the claim that we think it is. So um, when it comes to meat production, for instance, according to Michigan State Cooperative Extension or Michigan State University Cooperative Extension, the term natural on a meat label as defined by the USDA FCIS indicates that the product does not contain artificial flavors, coloring, chemicals, preservatives, or other synthetic ingredients. And that product and its ingredients are minimally processed. And while the USDA sets the definition for meat and the FDA sets the definition for non-animal food products as nothing artificial or synthetic included all color additives regarding a source has been included in or has been added to or a food that would not normally be expected to be in that food. Um, so therefore, food processing is the only indicator used for natural. Um, so again, you might think that it's natural, but there might be some things in there that aren't so natural. There's no study that suggests that you know, food labeled natural, all natural or natural is healthier than there is no certifying, and there's also no certifying agency or inspection of a manufacturer to go through and call themselves natural. So people can do it if they're within the definition um, I enclosed above. Another area of interest for consumers on the watch is health for healthier foods is sugar-free. So sugar, again, sugar-free, you're like, oh, wow, sugar-free, that sounds, uh, that's good. I'm trying to cut back on sugar. Sugar-free, um, you know, makes you think maybe that it's devoid of sugar, doesn't have any sugar in it. But it does mean that one serving contains less than 0.5 grams of sugar, both natural or added sugar. And therefore, if you're eating more of the product, you might be, in fact, consuming more sugar than what you're thinking. So, for instance, if a serving size is a half a cup and that half a cup has 0.5 grams of sugar and you're eating three cups of it, then you're going to get, you're going to get sugar. There's going to be more coming in because you're getting 0.5 times, you know, that amount. So you want to make sure that um, you're really looking at what is in there and reading that nutrition facts label, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, reduced sugar, on the other hand, means the product has at least 25% less sugar than the regular product, which is good, right? It's less, if it's a really sugary product, then it's less. 25%, you're thinking, okay, I'm saving, cutting back on some of that sugar. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's a good idea. But no sugar means um, not having that 25% less of a product that's super sugary might mean that it's got a lot more sugar than what you think it is, think it has in there. So you might want to, you know, just check that nutrition facts label, see how much sugar you're actually eating in there, even if it is 25% less um, because it is reduced sugar. So, so be cautious of that. Um, and no sugar in a product means uh, no sugar or ingredients containing sugar was added during the processing or packaging of that product. And many times products that have a sugar claim contain a sugar substitute or low calorie sweetener. So they have less sugar and still maintain the sweetness in the product, but they might have something artificial in there that you didn't know. So again, you want to read that ingredients label um, or nutrition facts label to check that out. And additionally, just because the product claims um, has no sugar, less sugar, it doesn't mean it's necessarily good for you. So the product might have taken the sugar out, but they might have filled it up with fat and artificial sweeteners or sodium to make up for the lost taste that you're having from removing the sugar. So just be aware of that too um, when you're consuming something. Gluten-free, um, this is a label that 
people who have um, a health issue with gluten, such as celiac disease or gluten intolerance allergy or an allergy, um, they would want to look for this label. And oftentimes gluten-free foods are higher, you know, in fats and sugars because they've taken the wheat out. So they're trying to make up for those tastes. So you want to be cautious of that, but there's really no need to eat gluten-free unless you have a gluten-related issue. Um, you know, the gluten-free products aren't necessarily going to be healthier for you. I know when they first started talking about gluten-free, it became really popular. People thought it was, a, I'm going to go on a gluten-free diet, but you don't need to be on a gluten-free diet unless you have you know, some type of health related issue with gluten. Um, so it's not something you need to be looking for, but people put it all over products all the time um, just to show that they're gluten free. Um, and sometimes consumers would buy them even though they don't really need to unless they have the health issue. Uh, made with real fruit is another one we see, which means only that there's some real fruit in there, um, but it doesn't mean that it's nutritious or good for us. Um, sometimes a product might use, um, might be like, apple flavored, but they're using bananas to flavor that. So it's not always the fruit that you think it is because they're using it as flavoring. And the FDA allows the label to say it's made with real fruit, even if there's only a little bit of fruit or fruit concentrate. So be, you know, be a little wary of that. Um, and I remember back in the day, my mom tells me this story all the time. She'll say, well, I remember buying juice for you because it said it was 10% juice. And I thought that that was a good nutrition claim. Um, but it, yeah, it probably had 10% juice in it. But then what was the other 90%? Was it water? Was it sugar water? You know, what was it? So you have to be careful of those claims. Um, whole grains, another example, just like um, fruit products that can be labeled whole grain, even if it only contains a small amount of the whole grain. And the Grain Council, which I'll show you, um, they have a little label that they put on that certifies whole grains in a product that you can look at on, for, on a label. Um, so you can check it out and it'll be a little easier, like kind of a cheat for you to find that label. And then finally on this section, we have no um, high fructose corn syrup. And this label is more of a marketing ploy. It's not saying there's no sugar in the product, just that there's no high fructose corn syrup. So if you're planning um, you know, on taking that high fructose corn syrup out, that's great, but it might still have a lot of sugar. So just be uh, aware of that. So there are all the buzzwords, not all of them by far, but a lot of the buzzwords, I just wanted to touch on them a minute to kind of give you guys an idea of what to look for and what to think about when you're purchasing. Because, you know, as the prices continue to rise at the cash, cashier's checkout um, counter, it's important to be an informed consumer and know what exactly you're purchasing and that you're not paying too much for um, what you want and what you need for your family and yourself. Here's a few labels that um, you may see on food products. I apologize, the ones on the right are really, really uh, blurry, but I wanted to give you an example of ones that I found um, just looking around the kitchen. So the first one is non-GMO label. And again, this is verified by a third party. You can see there it's verified by non-GMO project project.org. So they're going in and they're saying that this is, you know, a GMO, um, non-GMO product. And again, this is from pineapple. And we learned that pineapple is usually not genetically modified. So they put it on there. It looks nice and healthy. They have the butterfly, they have the check mark that looks like grass. So it makes us want to buy that. So it might pull us in. Um, you might decide, oh, I'm going to bu buy this, pay a little bit more for it because it's non-GMO when you really don't need to, because it wouldn't be something that would be uh, genetically modified anyway. And then the second one is the whole grain label. I mentioned when we were talking about whole grains, and this is um, again, a third party organization, the wholegrainscouncil.org, and they are certifying that this is a whole grain, uh, has nine grams or more per serving, and it takes some of the guesswork out for you to know what it is. Uh, the third label there, you can see the kind of blurry one there, um, that it is USDA organic symbol. And um, just below that is the AKC symbol. And these are both third party certifications. The AKC symbol is certifying that the product is kosher, which means the product, uh, the production is overseen by a rabbi, whereby meaning um, it meets Jewish dietary laws and requirements. Um, and then the USDA organic certification is certified that it's an organic product. The last label has certified plastic neutral. And again, folks look for those type of things to ensure that plastics are not leaking into their food. And if that's important for you, this is a third party certification that signifies that. And then the bottom NSF is a gluten, is a gluten free certification showing that it is indeed um, gluten free, but it is by a third party um, 
organization that has done this. So they, they've looked into it, they've done some of the guesswork for you, and they let you know that this is what you're looking for is on the product. But just make sure it's something you really need if you're going to pay extra for that product because it's certified that way. I did want to give you a little organic clue um, for those of you that might not know. So to helping you to find if something's truly organic, there's the little um, barcode label um, that'll be a bunch of bar, a bunch of lines, and then underneath of it there'll be some numbers. And if that number starts with a nine, then um, it, it is going to be an organic product and produce. So if it starts with a nine in produce, then it is signifying that it is organic and you can use that as your little clue uh, to know whether or not it's been certified organic. Oh, not organic. All right. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit about the labeling, I, I hope I didn't, you know, make your head spin on that one, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Hopefully you weren't making any assumptions, but if you were, you now you have you can be a little bit more of a Inform consumer and make sure what you're, you're buying is good for you from a dietary standpoint and understanding it. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on looking at labels. And again, not beyond labels, there's that conception that we get from, you know, maybe eating with a friend that's really health conscious or maybe like just an assumption that we make along the lines about how some things might be healthier than others. So I just want to give you a quick example of what sometimes things look like when we think they're healthier than what we were. And the reason I... I came up with this thought was my son works at a, a local um, food place. And he says to me, he, he prepares food. He says, mom, you know, people, it seems like anymore, people are all, always getting wraps as opposed to bread. So what's the difference? Is it healthy? Is that why they're doing it? And I thought, you know what they are? You see wraps a lot more. They're, you know, on the labels um, or, or on the menu a lot more. So I thought, let's look at it. Let's, let's break it down give you a quick little review of what um, you can do to kind of, again, be an informed consumer when looking at the nutrition facts label. I also have the ingredients label up there to compare the, th the two of them. So um, you can see here what's better, wrap or bread, um, and take a look at it. Um, in this comparison, the nutrition facts label and the ingredient label are listed out. Um, we have the whole wheat slice of bread at, on the right, and then the same information for a flour tortilla um, used for a wrap on the right. So the left is the whole wheat bread. You can see it says 110 calories. And then we got the wrap on the right there. Um, so let's start out. We're going to look at the difference in the calories here. So the calories you can see are in big bold letters for the wheat bread. It's 110 calories. And then um, for the other side, we have the calories for the wrap, which is 140. Now, I just want to point out to you, if you look at the top on the serving size, um, the serving size of the piece of bread is one slice. Uh, so, you, so if you're going to have a sandwich, you'd have to double this. So I just wanted to make sure to point that out to you. And that may be why people choose to have the wrap, because it's bigger, which is fine. Um, and then the, the serving size for the tortilla shell um, is the whole shell. So you can see that in there too. Next, we have total fats. So you can see here that we have the total fats of two grams um, and this, for the wheat bread and the saturated fat is zero. And um, so we have all the different fats listed out. Um, and, and you wanna make sure that you're looking at the differences in these, which I'm gonna point out here, the total fats on here. We have the saturated fats as one gram, which isn't a lot, but there's still saturated fat in there. So that's the one we want to be a little cautious on is that saturated fat. So there is some saturated fat in the wrap in comparison to the whole wheat bread. Next, we have the sodium count. For sodium, we have 160 milligrams of sodium for the piece of bread. And then we look over here, bouncing in, we have 410 milligrams. Oops, sorry, I went too fast there. We have uh, 110 or 410 milligrams um, in the sodium in the wrap, um, and so I want to just stop there and point out that the recommended sodium for um, daily consumption is 2,300 milligrams. So just in the tortilla shell, you're going to get 410 milligrams. So that's significantly higher than what we have for the piece of bread. Um, again, if you're eating two slices, it's going to go up a little bit. It'll be a little bit closer, but it's still significantly less. So you just want to be sure, you know, if you if you add other things, you know, a lot of times you see on the menu, you're getting 
the, the buffalo chicken wrap or something like that, you're gonna add sodium in the buffalo sauce, you're gonna add sodium in that meat that's in there probably. So it, it, could, it could be close to your whole day um, adding up if you're using that. So it's just something to be really aware of and, and be up to date on so that you know what, what you're getting. Um, I clicked too fast here. Okay, so next we have the carbohydrates, they're similar. Um, you got 21, uh, 21 grams for the bread, and then you have 24 grams over here on the right for the slice, uh, for the tortilla shell. Um, and remember, if you're eating two slices of whole wheat bread, that carb count is going to need to be doubled um, if you're looking to watch, watch that, um, meaning it's going to be 48 grams versus the, the, 20, uh, the 21 grams there. Uh, okay, dietary fiber, we have two grams. Um, I'm sorry, three grams on the um, whole wheat bread. And then we have two grams, or I'm sorry, one gram um, on the tortilla shell. We, you know, we lack fiber, as I've said before. Um, and so you wanna be watching out for those type of things too. Total sugars, we got three grams in the whole wheat bread, and then we have two in alongside in the other wrap. Um, and then finally, we have up top, you know, the recommendation for my plate is you make half your grains, whole grains. This does have whole wheat flour in there, whereas the other, uh, the tortilla shell has enriched bleached flour. Um, so, you, you know, weighing it out, it might seem like a healthier option, but we are getting a lot more sodium and not the whole wheat flour. So um, something to consider when you're, you know, eating out. And again, like, you know, you got to treat yourself once in a while, but just to be aware as an informed consumer. I also wanted to take another example of package labeling. Um, you know, this box, if you see the circles up there at the top, I have circled, they're whole, it's a whole grain. It's more than half the daily recommendations, nine vitamins and minerals, good source of fiber, has no artificial flavors, colors from additives, and it also has sweet sweetened multigrain cereal with whole oats, right? So it sounds like a really good option. Um, it appears at first glance to be, you know, you're trying a whole grain, you're getting your fiber, all that kind of stuff. But it's important to remember how much sugar is in something. So it does have um, 15 grams of sugar, which is almost four teaspoons. They don't advertise that on the front of the box. I don't think they're going to tell you that one. Um, so if you're looking to cut back on sugar and eat healthy, you might not re realize that it has that much sugar. So things that you want to look at here you want to look at added sugar amounts and gram ingredients labels for other types of sugars um, located on the ingredients label. Anything that ends in OSE on that ingredients level, level means it's a sugar. And if it's in the first four, then it's pretty heavy in that product because the first four are the most of what is included in that ingredients label. So just be aware of all of that information when you're checking out the package. Not to say it's a bad package, but it, um, you know, it, it sends you some clues that it's great for you, but, you know, it's got some sugar in there. So let's talk about some ways to substitute. I figured, um, you know, I gave you all the information, what to look out for, but now let's take some time to really figure out how we can, you know, eat better. Recommended daily allowances of sodium, like I said, are 2,300 milligrams, but the CDC actually thinks that we eat on average about 3,400 milligrams as a you know, country on average. So we're way over the daily recommendations of sodium. Um, and a good way to substitute that would be to use some fresh herbs like the one showed here, uh, that's some basil. And um, if, you're, if you're doing a recipe, you wanna know, oh, I have dried, I have fresh, that kind of, oh, sorry. I have dried or I have fresh, what, you know, which one should I use? A tablespoon of finely cut herbs or cr crumbled or dried herbs is uh, what a teaspoon equals. And then a quarter to half teaspoon ground or dried herbs. So that's the translation for that one. Um, so use them, you know, substitute for flavoring. Don't add salt, um, you know, put, put the herbs in instead. When you're cooking, don't add the salt. Um, try to use herbs instead. And instead of like immediately putting salt onto your, your dish that you're eating or making at home, try, you know, eating a little bit first and seeing if you really need it. But using um, spices and herbs is a great way to flavor food naturally without that sodium. And when you go out, ask them to hold the salt. You know, you can ask for fries without salt, and then you have the liberty of putting it on yourself to help, help cut that number down. Also, it's a good idea to use plant-based oils like olive, canola, peanut, or sesame oils to cook with. 
because they are unsaturated fats, um, which are both healthy fats that our bodies need. Um, and you also want to use healthy oils as a base for homemade dressings, um, because then that's gonna help you to cut back on some of those other oils that are contained in maybe some processed dressings that you might purchase off the, off the shelf at the supermarket. If you're a baker and you wanna bake, um, baking recipes that call for chocolate, you can substitute three tablespoons of cocoa for every ounce of chocolate in many recipes and get that flavor, maybe cut down a little bit of the fat there. Um, also when baking, um, if you're baking cakes or muffins, you can substitute oil, the oil that's called for in the recipe for applesauce. Applesauce gives um, a nice moist texture to cakes without all the fat. And when you're substituting applesauce for baking, the ratio is typically one to one. So if the recipe calls for a quarter cup of oil, use a quarter cup of applesauce instead. And that works really great in muffins and quick breads. Also, um, you could substitute canned evaporated milk in recipes that call for cream. And an easy way to make your own, uh, it's an easy way to make your baking a little bit healthier. It's lower in calories and it's more nourishing. Um, you can use, you can also use substitute uh, low fat milk or fat free milk for heavy cream. I do this all the time um, in sauce recipes, but it might be a little bit thinner. So if I'm making like a maybe a sauce to go over top of a spaghetti or something like that, I'll use the fat free milk. Um, instead of a heavy cream, but then I also try to thicken it a little bit with either some um, cornstarch or some um, flour, you know, because the heavy cream is a little bit heavier. So if you want to thicken the sauce a little bit, you can do that. Um, and it cuts down on the calories and the fat that you're using. Uh, if you use low fat cheese um, and cheese logs or appetizers and side dishes, it could cut um, up to 36 grams of fat and 320 calories for every eight ounces. So go with that low fat cheese when you can. And then also when you're making dips, um, make your dips, appetizers, and side dishes using a blend of Greek yogurt and fat-free sour cream. And that's going to cut about a thousand calories and 132 grams of fat per cup of mayonnaise. So um, you got a lot of cut in there. Also, you can, I do this one all the time too, try using low sodium, I said low sodium, chicken broth instead of butter and gravies or sauces. So you can even substitute broth or, or stock for butter and mashed potatoes. Um, we do that one, my mom has a dairy allergy. So we substitute the, the chicken, the low sodium um, chicken stock to make the mashed potatoes and that makes them dairy free or if you're vegan, you can eat the mashed potatoes that way. And that you know is good as long as you're making sure you're using that low sodium stock or broth and vegetables, right? What's not great about vegetables? Steamed or roasted veggies add lots of nutrients. They're low in calories, fats, and sodium. And you know if you try adding them to half of your plate to make half your plate fruits and vegetables every day, you're really gonna get a lot of the nutrients that you need to be healthy and when you're looking at these labels, it's going to help you to find those things you need to be healthy. Vegetables are full of fiber. And I've said before, we need more fiber. So they'll help you with fiber, the pro, the prebiotics, um, getting that stuff all regulated um, and making that good bacteria. Also, you want to be cautious when you're cooking vegetables. Try to add those spices instead of salt um, or you know, steam them some way so that you're not adding a lot of fat and salt to them. But they're great nutritious options. Wanted to let you know how to be in the know. So I gave you a lot of information today, a lot of stuff out there. I could have presented on this probably for six or seven hours easily because there's so much information out there. But I think it's really important, you know, that you're a, an informed consumer, a knowledgeable consumer. So be sure to check the nutrition facts label and the ingredients label. Check it out to make sure what you're eating is what you think you are. You know, I one day went to buy organic tomato in a can, tomato paste or something in the can. I looked at it and yeah, the tomatoes were organic and I was going to pay extra for that organic, but then there was a whole bunch of other stuff in there that was, I couldn't even pronounce. So obviously it wasn't organic. So you want to, you know, just be an informed consumer, check out the labels and the ingredients, try to eat whole foods whenever possible, like the ones shown here, which are, you know, the actual whole food, make your own foods like soups or snacks or salads or salad dressings. So you know what's in them. And then if you're looking, you know, you go to the grocery store, you see this label and you're like, what does this mean? You know, be an informed consumer, check out cooperative extension offices. I used, I found a lot of information across the country from cooperative extension offices on this topic. 
look for something that's .gov or .edu or you know a reliable source or journal that's not just something that's out there. Um, I saw a meme a couple of weeks ago where the guy's like, I'm going to Google, is coffee good for me? So he Googles, is coffee good for me? And he's like, oh yeah, coffee's good for me. I'm going to Google, is coffee bad for me? Oh yeah, Google says, yeah, coffee's bad for me. So it can go either way. So you want to make sure you have something from a cooperative extension office or a .gov, .edu that's going to give you the, the good information that you need um, to get what you're looking for out of what you're doing. So um, finally, my references. And then if you want to be in contact with me, you can certainly get in touch with Rachel or Joanne, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. But here's my information, just in case um, you'd like to check out some of my other 